Welcome this evening to the 52nd Presidential Address of the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. And our topic tonight is mapping the future of infectious diseases of the tropics. So this overview slide um, helps you understand, and we'll come back to this um, throughout the talk. It helps us navigate uh, where we're going. And I'm going to spend the first 10 minutes, because we are a very diverse audience today, talking a little bit about the history of the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene and some of the things that we do today and a little bit about what uh, I hope to achieve with the Society over the next two years um, as its president. We'll then talk um, so that you can understand a little bit more the sort of context of what we do both as a society and myself and my lab as researchers about the global burden of disease and particularly how that affects the tropics. We'll then move on to talk very specifically about what we do in our group. And the first thing that we'll do, like all um, good scientists and all good builders, is criticise what people have done in the past. And then we'll go on to how we do cartography today. And we'll probably spend most of the time talking about that, so mapping the present. We'll then talk about how we'll scale up what we're doing. Um, look a bit about some of the things that uh, we might need to worry about in the future and then we'll make some conclusions and go and have some drinks. So history. The Royal Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene was founded in 1907. It was designated a Royal Society in 1920 and its current patron is Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. It's been going for 106 years, so the more numerate among you will work out that it's had 51 presidents, two of whom have served two terms. 51 of our presidents have been white, 50 have been male, and 46 have been medically qualified. They have uh, an absolute constellation of uh, academic, civil, and military honours that are a bit too um, numerous to document. The median age at order, uh, to inauguration of presidency is 62. So I have the honour of being the 52nd president and not quite its oldest. <laughs> The motto of the society is uh, guardians of the torrid zone, or protectors of the tropics. So I think you get the impression from this that we're very established as a society, but historically we've also been very established mint, and that's one of the things that we'll talk about moving forward. So in preparing for my presidential address, in my obsessive compulsive way, I first read, in fact, what every one of the other presidents had said, um, preceding me, and 44 of those have indeed been published, and the rest of them I managed to nag other presidents and to get. So in, um, in doing that, it, it was actually quite difficult to trace some of these, so Jerry and I have put together a small article today, and we've made all of the historical uh, presidential addresses open access, so anybody can have a look at them. And I do this also to sort of forgive the cursory treatment I'm going to give tonight of the uh, um, history of the society. It's a really illustrious one and it does bear having a look at. It's an absolute who's who of um, tropical medicine. And I'll just show you some of the past presidents here. You've already seen Manson and Ross and we'll talk about those a little bit in a moment. And you can see uh, this kind of echoes the, the idea of established and establishment. You can see the presidential necklace that I'm sporting here goes through uh, several um, iterations as we move forward. For those of you that know anything about tropical medicine, this is an absolute who's who of um, who contributed um, to the development of the discipline over the last 100 years. Many malariologists that are extremely well known to me but many people in this list would be eponymous um, for many of the diseases that we're still worried about, brucellosis, leishmaniasis, etc. We're almost there. We move to the, the more colourful and the more smiling presidents of uh, recent times, and uh, three of the last ones are, are in the audience today. I can't really do justice to the history of society, the society, but I will um, essentially just talk about two of the past presidents. So Sir Patrick Manson was our first president. He discovered the role of uh, mosquitoes in the transmission of filarial worms with some experiments that would never um, pass any kind of uh, ethical approval today. He was also the founder of the London School of <coughs> Tropical Medicine. And I will repeat for you here 
the first inaugural success, uh, address of the society and the first paragraph ever written, and I, and I will recapitulate this here. So I trust that it does not augur badly for the success of the society that its first president has to commence with an apology. Such, unfortunately, is the case. I intended to devote some time to preparation, but having been called upon unexpectedly to take part in something else, I apologize in advance that I, I wasn't able to prepare and trust you will be indulgent to my shortcomings. Um, I'm afraid my neurosis for this uh, occasion was such that if there are any shortcomings, which I'm sure there will be, they won't be for a lack of uh, um, preparation. Perhaps our most famous president was the second one, Sir Ronald Ross, and he discovered the life cycle of avian malaria. He also received the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 1902 for this work, and incidentally he was the first Briton ever to receive the prize. He's also of interest to me because he um, is an infectious disease modeler, and that's uh, something that we've, I've dabbled in a little bit in the past. And moving on now from the history, so if you'll, if you'll let me, it is an illustrious history, but we're going to move on and talk about the society today. So our charitable objects, and uh, for those of you who don't know about charitable law, which I've been finding out uh, a lot about this year, it's essentially the, the mandate of the society. What do we exist for? And it's to promote the health and advance the study of the control and prevention of diseases in man and other animals. And uh, that's a bit of... Uh, so we'll, I'll move on to that in a second. It's, uh, I don't think that's so well known. Um, and it's to do with uh, those diseases in the tropics and disadvantaged communities around the world. We have, a, after a recent governance review, a very strong structure. So Jerry McHugh is our chief executive. Our immediate past president was Professor Wynne Stanley. We have 12 trustees, nine of which are from the, uh, elected from the fellowship, and three of whom we draft in for additional skills, such as financing. We formally welcome three new trustees today, uh, Peter Horby, uh, Dr. Vandenbroek, and Dr. Desabi. And we also formally welcome our new uh, Vice President, Dr. Simon Cathcart, who's a, a long-time serving trustee and member of the society. Our fellowship uh, numbers over 1,000 in 89 different countries. And you'll see uh, potentially something else that I'd like to deal with uh, over the next two years is that we have a, a quite a strong geographical bias in our membership. One of the things that we do as a society is arrange lots of meetings and today we've had the annual research in progress um, which is predominantly for young scientists, very stimulating meeting today and I'll talk more about our, our, our kind of trademark meeting, our biennial. The next one is in Oxford in 2014, about this time next year and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, as I will be um, hoping to get some support from many of the uh, illustrious people in the audience today. We run two journals, the Transactions uh, Monthly, launched in 1907, uh, Transactions of the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, and the more recent quarterly journal, uh, International Health. We also give out lots of honours and awards, um, five of which are uh, there on the slide today. I'm going to highlight just two of those. Um, so we have the, the Manson Medal here. This is our most prestigious medal. And in 2013, for those of you who weren't here at our AGM, that goes to Professor David Molyneux in the audience. And that's our highest honor for contributions to tropical medicine. So well done, David. Our next and also one of our oldest medals is the Chalmers Medal, also for contributions to tropical medicine. We give this one out annually to someone uh, under the age of 46, and today that went to Professor Joanne Webster. So what do I uh, intend to do um, as president? Well, I want to reiterate the fact that, uh, um, and in fact steal what uh, Peter just said, the, there is a, a nervous system in the society that runs regardless of the uh, the president there. So I, I benefit some, from some extremely um, strong foundations, a constitutional restructuring and very stable finances. And, I, and as a president of a society like this, that's a, that's a really nice thing to do. My main aim really is not to upset any of that and focus on the business of the society itself rather than its running. Um, we're also at a, pa a, a path in the society where we're coming to the end of one five-year plan and 
Hence, it's a really good time to come in as president because not only do I get the opportunity to influence the next two years, I do actually get the opportunity to influence with the trustees and the staff the next five years. Some of the things that I'm going to mention um, in the, the next two slides, that things that I want to focus on aren't particularly novel or exciting, but they are important to us. And one of the things that I think that we need to always strive to do better is improve our communication with the existing fellowship. And there are many things um, we've already started to try and improve that. And one of the things I'm particularly um, keen to do is advocate uh, to and for a wider fellowship. So this comes back to this uh, slightly establishment notion and reputation that the society has. So I hope after the next two years we'll be able to present a slide to you of our fellowship that's a bit more demographically and geographically diverse. One of the things I think the society perhaps hasn't um, batted as strongly as it may have done in the past years is international health and development policy. And I would like to think how collectively we could play more of a role in that. And one of the things as, as a as steward, I do need to keep a very close eye on our key revenue generators. I come into this as a, as a very um, lucky president. We've got buoyant finances. I certainly don't want to leave after two years having caused any problems there. Um, and essentially one of the things that helps us uh, improve our or fulfill our charitable objects is our journal stock. These we need to keep an eye on. Our impact factor um, we, we want to improve and we as a, a publishing society need to look about the, um, the impact that open access will have upon us. And for a society it's a, it's a double-edged sword for us because it is a big um, revenue generator. So that's something that we've had to think about moving forward. So we've done with the history, um, and I'm now going to move on to the, uh, the, the talk in terms of the, the cartography, the work that uh, we do ourselves. And I first want to talk about the global burden of disease so that you perhaps have a bit more of a, a, a notion as to what we are contending with as a as society um, and some of the things that uh, determine the priorities. So the Global Burden of Disease Study, um, very nicely reported at the end of uh, December 2012, very useful for this particular presentation. So I've got updated numbers for 2010, which I can synthesize for you. So essentially the Global Burden of Disease Study, for those of you that don't know it, is a mortality and morbidity audit. So across the world, we have about 53 million deaths each year. And what this study does is to allocate those to 235 different diseases and injuries so that essentially we can have a top of the pops for diseases so that we can work out which one um, contributes more to disease and death than any other. There are two components to burden of disease, and so this is death and disease or mortality and morbidity, and we can put those together, and this is the only equation you'll get, and it's a fairly simple one, um, into one metric called a DALI, and I do need you to understand that. So it's a, a disability-adjusted life year, and this has two components. It's years of life lost due to the mortality, so the mortality component, and the years lived with a disability, so the disability component. And if you put those both together as a single metric, you get a very good idea about the burden of disease in any location. And this is essentially what this massive study does. It gets all its data from vital res registration, and vital registration is in any country, if you die, people will try to work out what you died of and record that somewhere. And as you might imagine, that's highly variable across the world about the, um, the level of um, diagnostic spe specificity and the rigor of the recording. But if you get enough information on that, and uh, the Global Burden of Disease Study is a, is, a, is a massive undertaking, you can start to classify these things by age, sex, and geographical regions. And the causes are categorized into three main groups, which will also be important to us moving forward. So these are communicable, non-communicable, and injuries. So communicable are those that we can transmit between each other, either directly or by a vector. Non-communicable are those that we um, cannot uh, transmit between ourselves, such as a, a heart attack and injuries or obviously road traffic accidents, self-harm, etc. And what we're going to do is take the results of this study um, 
and compare prospects of uh, life in tropics and non-tropics. So to do that, we, um, this is your first map. So the Global Burden of Disease study defines 21 regions around the world, and these are defined for um, epidemiological homogeneity and geographical contiguity. So, but we need to look at those in terms of the tropics. So essentially what we've done is simply categorise those into two. And it's not a perfect fit, but it's a pretty good one. So these are the, um, the tropical regions of the world, and those are the countries that fit in it. So all the statistics I'm going to show you in the next couple of graphs essentially compare these green regions to these blue regions. So I admit that this is uh, quite a complicated table, but there's, um, you don't really need to understand any of the um, particular conditions here. You just need to understand the groupings. And you need to understand that this is the tropical table and this is the not tropical table. So this is the green area in our previous map and this is the blue area. So in these two tables, you have the three um, different categories of diseases. So the communicable ones, the non-communicable ones, and the injuries that we described earlier. And there are some things that I want to pull out um, to essentially reveal to you that the tropics are a unique place. So DALIs are not equal between these two regions. If you look at mortality on its own, the, the, the mortality burden is about approximately the same uh, in the tropical and non-tropical parts of the world. But we have a much more, so this is billion DALIs, so this is 1.56 billion disability adjusted life years in the tropics. So this is um, disease and um, death in one, in one metric. And you can see from one to 20 here, this is the top 10, uh, sorry, the top 20 causes and the number of the, or the fraction of those um, related to each specific condition. Heart disease and stroke are the biggest um, mortal, uh, mortality in both the tropics and the non-tropics, but when we start to look at this wider metric, DALIs, you'll see that essentially 12 of the top 20 causes here are communicable diseases, infectious diseases, and they're one of the things that we're most concerned about. And if you want to know why so many of us worry about malaria and neglected tropical diseases, you can see that they're top of the pops in terms of um, disability adjusted life years in the tropics. So just to um, ram that home a little bit more, what does that actually translate to into um, things that we can sort of take home messages if you like? So the, the, the tropics, almost 50% of all the burden of disease in the tropics is, is a communicable disease one. And I guess what I'm trying to say here is that tropical medicine, even though we've been going for 100 years, remains a justifiable concept, and that the, these regions um, are unique in terms of both the burden of disease they have and the type of diseases that they have. So your mean age of um, death, if you're in the tropics, is still only 46 years compared to 65 um, from the not tropics. And the big differential, which we'll explore just a little bit more in a moment, is under five mortality. So six million per annum uh, in tropical regions versus less than a million in tropical regions, in non-tropical regions. So before we get all completely um, depressed, and this is something that I really try and um, push home to, to our students, is that over my lifetime, which is, is roughly here, we have done fantastic things to under five mortality rates, and many of the people in this room can really take credit for being part of that. And it's this bit that I want to, to focus on here. So we've, we've gone from five to one million um, under five deaths in the non-tropical parts of the world since 1970. And I think that's a fantastic achievement and not one that um, is really that well known. And the, the point that I want to make with that is that we've done that with our existing suite of interventions. So there's no new magic bullets needed here. We've, th there's a, a huge amount of difference we can make with our existing suite. So one of the things I'd like to think about moving forward, and this line here is just taking this gradient. It's a, this is a, an entirely business as usual extrapolation of what we've done here. This will never be achieved, we'll never get to, to zero. But essentially what I like to do to, to frame our opportunity as it were, what I and the society and, and all of us should be striving to do over the next um, 
20 or so years is to look at what we can do to increase the, the or decrease the gradient of that to move this um, to affect this potential burden in here moving forward and I and I even think about that in terms of um, if we have a vaccine development line for example that doesn't bring a vaccine into about 2020 this is all that opportunity lost in that period so it's a nice way to, to frame what we can do at the moment and just remember that we did all of this with tools that we have now. So that's the global burden of disease, and that's the, the kind of, um, if you like, that's the space that we operate in, that's the, um, the, the, the kind of area that we want to influence, both as a society and as, uh, in our own little way as a research group. So how do we do that? Well, we spend a lot of time making maps, and I kind of want to explain to you why we do that and what the importance of that is for um, the global burden of disease. So why would we want to make a map in the first place? Well, we can use maps for a whole variety of things, and they can be very simply just advocacy. People like to know the distributions of disease and put them on uh, uh, glossy things to show to policymakers, and that um, shouldn't be underestimated. But we can use maps, and I hope to show you that uh, as we move forward, as a very evidence-based spatial audit of current risk. And the thing that um, we're using maps more and more to do now is to use those as monitoring and evaluation tools so they can establish baselines from which we can monitor change and measure impact. So that's essentially why we make maps. So the question then moves to why do we want to make new maps? There are, there are lots of them out there. We've all seen them. And this is where I get into builder mode again and um, say about how all the work done in the past really wasn't up to scratch. And uh, I, I, this, to a good approximation, is true for most of the historical literature in cartography. There is no evidence base, or not one that you can go back and find. So, I mean, today it becomes a, it's a very standard thing to publish and make available all the information that goes into the map, but historically that never, never was the case. They also didn't benefit from all the modern computer and GIS is a geographic information systems, just a shorthand for um, computer-based cartography. And one of the things that we try to do now, which was never really done in the past, was to give you an idea of how uncertain or certain we are about certain predictions in the maps, um, because they vary enormously spatially. So we're going to talk a little bit about what maps we can make, what has been done, and what can be done. So infectious diseases, let's think a little bit more broadly now. So there are about 1,400 beasties, pathogens, ever recorded in human beings. And they, they may not be clinically significant, but that's about 1,400 that, that it's been documented. Uh, a pathogen has some sort has been trying to make a living in a human being. Not all of those um, do that very frequently, and there are about 355 of those we counted up that are probably well known enough that they form parts of medical curricula and that you would have a, a if you're an extremely uh, clever physician, you'd have a, at least a shooting um, chance of having come across them at some point in your teaching or training. So the question then we, we set ourselves is, well, of all of these conditions out there, should we map them all? Why don't we have a very good idea, or do we have a very good idea, about their geographical distributions? So we set about thinking, in a, in a very much a landscape way, what, uh, what actually do we need to know about any um, condition before we can map it? And there are, um, there are a few, obviously, very, very basic things, but we went through and classified all of the, the according to these rules. So spatial things first. I mean... It, is the disease that we're, we might be worried about, does it show any geographical dependence? And some of them don't. Um, for example, uh, Epstein-Barr virus, um, 80 to 90% prevalence in all human populations. So if you know, essentially, if you know where the human population are, there's not a great rationale for mapping that. Etiology, do we understand the pathogen's life history? Well, we really do need to know a little bit about what's going on if we want to try and map something in any evidence-based way. And there are many of these 355 that, believe it or not, we still don't know um, how they work and what their life histories are. If we want to do any um, science, people need to um, measure things about the particular pathogen you're inter interested in. And if there aren't many of those measurements around, you're not really on a good starter. 
And utilities, of these 355, not all of them by any means are of public health interest. So essentially what we did is take those rules, put them through some decision trees, do a very um, rigorous systematic review of these 355 and uh, the two people that spent most of the time doing that are in the audience, um, Catherine and David. And essentially what we found was that there were about 174 of these 355 conditions that we could map and that only 7% of those had been. So I'm going to show you that uh, as a kind of landscape of opportunity, if you like. So this is, you won't be able to read any of this, and we'll zoom in on it in a moment, but this is the 174 conditions that we think there is a very good rationale to map, both in terms of um, all the information out there, whether it's geographically variable, um, whether there's a public health interest in doing so or not. And um, just to show you that there are um, some obvious ones in there and some ones that are quite rarefied in that list of uh, 174. And if we go back, what we then did is score every one of those. So the, if you have a black line here that goes from the center of the circle all the way to the edge, we think you've done enough of a job in terms of the data that was available and the mapping techniques that are available in relation to that particular disease. So that, for this one, it scores very, very highly. And the idea that you're supposed to get from this graphic is that essentially there's a massive landscape of opportunity to improve our geographical knowledge of these 174 conditions. So that's the, the landscape of opportunity for um, cartography, if you like. And what we're going to do now is talk about um, essentially how we do those maps. And we're going to do that with an example, our most recent example of dengue. And then we'll move on to say, well, we've done it for one disease here. How do we scale that up for, for an awful lot? And then Essentially, that's the end of the talk. So, like an awful lot of epidemiology, we build on um, lots of hard work that's done by ecologists, and we're going to talk a little bit about ecological theory and how occurrence mapping works, but not a great deal about that because I don't have the time. We're going to talk about a little bit about dengue because that's the example that we're choosing here. Um, one of the things that we've paid a lot of attention to as a research group I'm going to go through these, evidence consensus, you'll hear more about all of these, occurrence points, pseudo-absence points, environmental and epidemiological covariates, and essentially how we make risk maps. And I'll do that in a very much a, a, a graphical way. And then I'll try and persuade you that these maps aren't just uh, pretty surfaces and that we can do um, very useful things with them in relation to public health. So ecological theory, well we... It's actually not, not a very difficult um, concept, if you know what the concept of a niche is. So we um, assume that the observations we have of a particular disease approximate the realised niche of that pathogen. So it, essentially what that means is we, all the points of occurrences that we have, we're, we're assuming in our, in our analysis that from those, we have a, a, a pretty good sample of where um, that disease occurs across the world. And then we're also making the next assumption that if we look at the environmental conditions of each one of those occurrence points, we can make a statistical model with which we can infer the probability of the disease occurring in a new location where we don't have data from that model. Now, uh, again, we'll go into um, explore exactly how we do that, but you can almost guess from the outset that that's not a perfect, um, those are not a perfect set of assumptions by any means. And I, I kind of bring these out right from the start just to um, acknowledge the fact that we, we are aware of those assumptions. And as I talk through the way that we do these, um, uh, we, we conduct this mapping, it will give you an idea that we're both cognizant of those and that we try very hard to minimise uh, essentially the imperfection in our assumptions. So the first one is sampling. Do we capture enough of the spatial variation of any particular um, species, or in our case, pathogen, to, to reliably describe its distribution. Um, and then you might also think that there are lots of things, um, particularly with diseases, there are lots of reasons why uh, a species or a disease might not occupy the full um, uh, extent of the environment geographically that it's able to. 
Um, those would be biotic interactions, so for the ecologists among you, things like uh, predation and competition. But they can also be biogeographical. A disease might just simply not have got to an area yet. And particularly with diseases, they can be because of human impact. If we're trying to map a disease that has a, a very big vaccination program, we clearly need to take that into account. Then there's also, in this step where we try and relate occurrence to covariates, we're also making the assumption that our covariate suite is representative of all the things that describe um, or, or rather determine the um, environmental space of a particular disease. And that might, may, or not, may or may not be a good assumption. And we'll go through and talk about each of those in a moment, but essentially what we try to do is overcome the first one by getting as much data as we can. We try and under overcome the second one by uh, very crudely trying to understand the um, global distribution of the disease before we start. And we try and tackle the third one by essentially bringing our biological experience and our epidemiology to, un to make the environmental data sets that we bring to bear on each disease very bespoke to that particular um, pathogen. So just before we um, go on to explore each of those in a bit more detail, why would we be interested in mapping dengue? Well, before we started, the, its um, global distribution was very uncertainly known, and its burden was um, sort of also a, a matter for a lot of conjecture. It's a mild to fatal disease with no cure, so there's nothing you can do about it once you get it. It's um, supportive care. It's also um, day-biting Aedes mosquitoes, so these vectors are very, very hard to avoid. Many of the things that you might be familiar with, like bed nets, for example, will do you no good. And control is extremely difficult. Um, in temperate regions, this is a disease that's um, expanding. Uh, sorry, in tropical regions, this is a disease that is expanding massively. And even in countries like Singapore, which if any of you have ever visited, is extremely um, uh, an outlier in terms of the, uh, the way that it conducts its uh, um, control. Even Singapore can't get um, this disease under control. The reason for that is that uh, the larvae and the adults thrive in urban areas, so everything that we do in terms of growers, populations, and we'll come back to this a little bit later, helps um, dengue. Its vectors spread readily on boats, its virus spreads readily in humans on aircraft, so very approximately as malaria kind of recedes across the world, dengue is expanding, so it's one of those ones that we're very interested to um, essentially audit. So. I'm going to talk, this is um, essentially the A, B, C, and D, and E that I just uh, uh, talked about by bullet points, evidence, consensus, occurrence points, pseudo-absence generation, our environmental covariates, and the risk map that we produce. So essentially we use these two things, the occurrence points and the evidence-based consensus, to make up some absence points, and I will explain that bit in a minute. We compare that with covariates, make a statistical model, and push out a risk map. So that is essentially what we do, um, and I'll go and explain each one of those in a little bit more detail. So evidence-based consensus, what on earth is that? Well, International Travel Health Guidelines, which is the acronym there, so before we started, um, disagreed on the endemic status of 34 territories. So that, th those particular um, International Travel Health Guidelines are the WHO and the CDC um, books, and there are, um, just for those who are not familiar with GIS, there are about 270 to 280 um, territories in the world, depending on how you classify them. And there are about 100 countries on average, uh, depending on whose estimates you, you take, that have um, dengue in the world. So the fact that um, two of our international organisations can disagree on quite so many countries is, um, lets you know kind of where we start. Ollie Brady in the audience is the person that did all of the work here. And essentially what we want to do and what we try and do with every one of our um, mapping diseases at the global extent now is do this very um, crude spatial approximation of where the disease is. And this gets rid of some of the problems in extrapolating to areas where we simply know for, for whatever reason the disease doesn't exist. So evidence-based consensus is certainly something that we do. And just to, so you can understand this map, if it's green, we're just absolutely certain that the disease doesn't occur there. If we're red, we're very certain that the disease does occur there. And if it's any of the colours in between, we, the evidence is um, conflicting. 
And not only can we use that to essentially constrain where we predict in the world, we can use these formally in the analysis as well. I won't go too much into that. The next thing is the occurrence data, and this is a pretty boring slide, but I do want to um, emphasize the fact that historically, all of this has been done manually. And essentially what we do is people within the group do literature researches in these types of things. And for those of you who are not familiar with that, there are large archives of um, scientific literature in relation to diseases which you can search. You can get all of those papers, you can read them, and you can, occur, you can um, work out where the disease was and you can geoposition that and you can do all of that manually. I, I kind of um, guess that you might understand that that's quite a labour-intensive process and takes an awful lot of time and an awful lot of people. And over uh, a period of about two years, we managed to get about 8,000 points from 106 countries from dengue. Um, I also bring up this because it, uh, it, it was in... Um, the, the dengue maps that I'm going to show you in just a moment, we've also started to branch out and use other pieces of information and a new collaboration for us it was this group health map. We do accept data, again this comes up but we're often challenged on this for as back as far as we can go, um, but I don't see that as, a, as the greatest problem in many of the things that we do and just to reassure you the vast majority of the data that we um, use to map occurrence is recent, so it's post-2000. So essentially, we try and get as much information as we possibly can. We, um, this shows visually those um, uh, statistics that I just um, outlined there. And the, the thing that you should uh, essentially get from this map, and this will underscore the um, uncertainty metrics that are important to always see with your maps, is that we're actually very data poor in Africa. And this will be a focus of future research for us. I'm going to skip over this one, but uh, if you do want to um, make any niche modelers um, slightly uncomfortable, this is the sort of area to start asking questions about. And the fact is that um, we don't ever usually record in the literature when we don't find something. So there are all kinds of um, dark arts around uh, essentially making up data in niche mapping. It's not something unique to what we've done. And the way that we get over some of those assumptions is just an ensemble through a whole, a whole range of assumptions that we can make there and take average products. I didn't want to gloss over that fact because uh, it, is, it is something that um, we spend a lot of time thinking about and trying to get right. Environmental data sets. So these are all the things that we then try and stack up on the right-hand side to say, well, what do we think is determining the, the distribution of all those occurrence points? And so what can we start to build a statistical model from? You'll be very familiar with things like uh, um, climatology. So this is a map of global rainfall, very little rainfall here, up to almost a metre per month um, in various parts of the world. And you'll pretty much be familiar with the fact that we can get those information from lots of places. i show you the next one. Um, this isn't just temperature. When we um, know about a specific disease and have uh, a lot of experimental work done, which we do for dengue, you can actually start to transform your uh, meteorological variables into a things that are a little bit more, we hope, biologically relevant. So this is some work that Ollie's leading in our group, and it's the um, essentially we change temperature into daily dengue transmission suitability um, based on that and some experiments that have been done. And the point essentially is there is that we do make a lot of effort to try and choose very carefully the environmental data sets that we throw in. We don't just uh, take everything that we can throw at the analysis. And uh, although you'll be familiar with things like rainfall and temperature, we can put in any um, kind of covariate, and this is a, a more recent one, and i show you this. Um, this is a pixel-based gross domestic product, and you'll know that many other things affect the outcomes of diseases, so those are available to us in the analysis, and this is another one of them. I don't have a lot of time um, to talk about boosted regression trees and some of the methods that we use, um, but this is, after going through all of that process, this is the map that we, that we generate. And any, anybody in this business will be able to give you very good metrics of the statistical accuracy with which they make those predictions, so don't trust those for a minute. If, uh, if you see a bad statistics on the map, then, uh, then you um, really should be wary of it. But we like to use three different things to essentially um, test uh, how well we're doing. 
So statistical accuracy is one thing, and what we can do is, of course, drop out uh, certain fractions of data, redo the map, and see how well we're predicting the things that we already know, and that would be the standard way to do it. But we also can look at geographical plausibility. Is this map, we can show it to lots of experts, does it, um, does it do what we expect it to do? Is it um, uh, giving us a good description of our definitive extent, the, um, the, the, the map that Ollie made that I just showed you, and the occurrence data that we've collected? And the other thing that makes us particularly reassured when we make a map is if the covariates that it selects to make that um, map are epidemiologically relevant. And the three that I just showed you um, weren't a random selection. They happened to be the three that came out as the biggest predictors of dengue in this mapping process. And that, all of that together helps us um, uh, improve the, the faith, if you like, or, or our um, rigour with which we can stand by a particular map. Um, so... I'm going to be told off by our um, journal editor here for not labelling my access, uh, axes uh, appropriately, but uh, essentially you don't really need to know too much about these. Um, this is the, the, the metric, this is the probability of occurrence that we predict here, and if we have a whole series of cohort studies, um, so this is where people will go out and uh, measure over a year a very defined community and the amount of disease that they get, and we can geoposition those on the map and we have an incidence rate, we can define, define a relationship between the probability of occurrence of the disease and incidence, and we can use that to make burden estimates. And that's exactly what we did um, for dengue. Dengue comes in, in, in two flavours, really. There's apparent infections, so those are infections that um, are, have an effect on you that's significant enough to stop you going to school or going to work, and are many, many inapparent infections as well. And these are what these two different graphs show. And then we can start to total those up with um, uh, population services for 2010. And we can make consistent global estimates in a way that had never been done. And, these, and this is just to, to reinforce the facts as to why maps are useful. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is already using these figures to evaluate the position of dengue in its portfolio of activities. Garvey is doing the same thing, should a dengue vaccine ever become available. And a recent development is all that the surfaces that we start to make will also now start feeding back into the global burden of disease 2013. So these maps will then go into covariates um, to help those predictions um, moving forward. So one of the problems with the global burden of disease is it, its iterations are only um, every five years. So that is moving to an annual basis now. And one of the things that they really want to help um, in moving that forward is to have um, covariates for this. So that's one of the motivations for the ambition that we'll talk about uh, in a moment. So uh, one of the things that's important for me to do is acknowledge the fact that none of this is done um, on my own. Um, this is uh, a large group of international collaborators that uh, help us do this research and I, I just want to call that out there. Sam, uh, the first uh, author of this, is in, in the audience and uh, if I haven't uh, communicated what we did in that uh, particular article sufficiently well, it, it's there for you to read. So that took us, um, quite a few of us, uh, essentially about two years to complete. And if, you, if we go back to thinking about how we might scale up for the future, I'm going to restate the, the problem set there. So that's two, two years, approximately five or six people employed in that project. You'll see in terms of leverage time, a massive contribution. So how on earth would we be able to scale up that kind of um, activity for these 174 diseases that we think should be mapped? So this is why I want to take our group moving forward and uh, essentially challenge us with the ambition of making a global atlas of all of these infectious diseases. So try and think through how we might go about doing that. And that's what we're going to spend the rest of our time uh, devoted to. Uh, we're going to talk about the data sets that we can harvest um, to make available for that. We're going to come across terms about big data and big signal and we're going to also talk about how we might automate many of the things that we do. And I might slip into this term so I'll uh, 
I'll, I'll talk about the acronym from the start. So it's our um, description for this whole enterprise, this whole process, and it's Atlas of Baseline Risk Assessment for Infectious Diseases. So if I start talking about a braid, that's what I mean. It's this whole concept of can we make a global atlas for infectious diseases? So if we um, think about the first part of that process is where do we actually get all our occurrence data from in the first place? Well, we manually look at things like PubMed, and very rarely, um, funnily enough, do people look at GenBank historically. And essentially all I want to do with this slide is to let you know that there are, there are resources out there that we just really don't utilise to their full extent. So PubMed has about 21 million entries and from various um, sort of tests that we've done, we think there are well over um, half a million decent occurrence points that we could be brought to bear on at least 168 of our 174 diseases. I won't read out all the same numbers for GenBank, but you get the idea. There are lots and lots of high provenance, and what I mean by high provenance is that they're, they're very well documented occurrences of a, a particular disease. So if you've got an entry on GenBank, which is its genetic sequence, it's highly likely to be the disease that you're worried about. Um, one of the things that people, when we start to talk about GenBank for risk mapping, that they always say is, well, GenBank will only have, nobody geopositions it. Well, in fact, already 13% of uh, entries in GenBank are already geopositioned. And this map here just shows you an approximate, um, if you add up all of those entries, and, and Sam did this one, uh, it has a very good global distribution already. So it's, uh, it's, it's a much underutilized resource and one of the ones that we'll be moving forward with. Web reporting systems, these are also really not used, and I need to thank um, John Brownstein and Nigel Collier here, who run HealthMap and Biocaster respectively. So they're on board with the Braid, they're, they're new collaborators of ours, and they, their archive doesn't go back as far, they both started in about 2006. And what they do is they, they host websites like this that uh, essentially um, alert people to any outbreaks of particular diseases, um, and you can see that they cover quite a few of these, respectively, and that there are accumulating very big archives of occurrence points which they can make available. And when we have looked at their back catalogue, we see that they've got a lot of things that we can already use. So now we get on to um, some of the more social media um, type things, and this is where I think um, this could be potentially very, very transformative for all of the things that we do. And I know there'll be some doubters out here, so I'm going to take some... Uh, um, some time over this slide, and Twitter is the one that I'd like you to think about, although it's not an exclusive, um, uh, uh, don't, don't think of it as the only example. I think, uh, you know, Twitter is there, it's, um, it's going to be all in our share portfolios fairly soon, I imagine, um, but it's, it's one among many, and I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an area to keep an eye on. Already, uh, and these statistics, it's growing so fast that these statistics I've updated about two or three times over the generation of this talk, and it's, a, it's somewhere more than 150 million tweets a day, and that's increasing exponentially. 5% of these are already geopositioned, and I'll show you this movie in a minute. And, and, and the assumption, which I think is a fairly safe one, is that there, there is a huge amount of disease-relevant data in here that we can, we can use. And, I'll, and I'll, I'll play a movie, which is a very, uh, it just runs for, for seven hours. And I would encourage anyone to play around with this website, TweetPing. Um, you, you can get a very um, quick idea about where people are tweeting in the world, and I'll show you that in a second. But the other thing that I do want to emphasize with this social media is it, and this is a thing that I don't think is very well um, documented now, is it's two-way. So we, if somebody starts tweeting an awful lot about a particular disease in a particular location, there's nothing to stop us uh, automating um, tweets back to them and, and trying to find out the provenance of that information. And that's the bit that tends to be um, forgotten in some of this. So a huge amount of data, and we'll have a look at that in a second. So this um, movie here is, a, is tweeting. So this is seven hours um, displayed in, uh, I'm not sure how many seconds it goes on, and the things that I want to, um, so this is a subsample of what everybody's tweeting for everything around the world. We've done the experiments to see, essentially, for our 174 diseases, what people are tweeting about. 
and there are um, lots of disease-related tweets around the world. But the, the take-home message for this, remember this is only seven hours and it gets up to um, many hundreds of thousands of tweets already, is that you're, you're perhaps the stereotype that you would have come in with is that it would only be Europe and North America and a few countries like that that are tweeting. Well, it's evidently not the case. Indonesia is the second biggest tweeter in the world, and Iqbal, if you, I'm not sure if you're, yeah, you're out there, you can uh, explain to us why that is um, later. Um, but all around the world, in many of the areas that we're interested in infectious diseases, people are extremely active in social media. So don't come with that prejudice that it's not a, 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 something that we can get lots of information comprehensively and globally. I'll acknowledge that there, <laughs> there are certain areas of the world that we, we might always be having an uphill battle, but that wouldn't just be um, unique to social media. So this is one thing that we think um, moving forward will be um, very important to us, and this is essentially just grabbing as much information as we can. And if you start to talk about big data, and I'd like to prefer to use the term big signal, where, is the, where, where can we get the most useful information, People start to use these V words, which get me very confused, volume, veracity, volume, and velocity, in relation to types of data. But essentially what they mean is how much of it is there already, what's the archive, what's its provenance, how, how, how can we trust in that information, how quickly is it updated, and how timely is it. And just to um, bring this home, I think that our social media, nobody really archives many of the tweets at the moment. Um, it, at least in a way that's available to us. I'm sure there's particular companies that have very big archives of those. Um, the, the veracity there, I mean, there, there is a huge amount of uh, information that we'll want to discard there and a huge amount of chat. I, I accept that um, right from the outset. But you can't argue that its, its volume is impressive and its timeliness is, um, it cannot be surpassed by anything else. And if you contrast that to the, our more traditional sources, and even these we underutilize, it's essentially a mirror image in, in, in many of the things that we would be interested in. And I think web reports come sort of somewhere in the middle of all of those. So essentially, in the nutshell, the idea of a braid is to use all of those things together and use the, the wonderful archives that we have here a little better to help triage some of the information that we use here and to certainly um, get the signal from this. But you'll know that that's not very timely, but this is. And the whole concept is bringing all of the strengths of some parts of this data stream together to get much better timely occurrence data with which to feed this process. So you've seen this graphic before, and that's the, um, the risk mapping. And the next uh, thing, the, the next concept of a braid to to try and um, articulate to you all, is that don't think of this as a static product anymore. This arrow is extremely important, and the notion that we would try to sell with a braid, and the notion that we think will um, start to move things forward, is that this should be thought of as not a static map, but one that continually evolves. So if we uh, essentially automate this process, we should be able to iterate, not only should we be able to make one map for all of these diseases, we should be able to make a live map for all of these and it should be continually updated. So a little bit more um, detail on about how we might want to do that. So the first of is we need to take humans out of the link of, of reading all of these abstracts. And you might think, well, that's the, how on earth do you do that? But this is what web reporting systems already do. So they have very uh, advanced machine learning um, to look at both the provenance of the information and to automatically geoposition. So that's something we want to leverage and we want to use that information and bring it in and essentially use all of the wonderful archives in PubMed and ProMed which are freely available to us to rapidly um, increase the, the information content with which we're trying to uh, map all infectious diseases. We can automate the mapping. That's actually not a particularly hard thing to do. Um, we adopt a technique called boosted regression trees for, for a whole host of reasons, but there are many techniques that you could use here to automate this mapping, and that's essentially just a programming problem. One of the things that we're um, very committed to doing is also using much more um, 
novel techniques to try and um, look at the validation in, in terms of a braid. So if you imagine you've got 174 conditions uh, that you're trying to look at and you're iterating those um, perhaps on a, a, a weekly basis, you really do need to um, bring in the crowds to start helping you um, look at those uh, maps. And we do believe that public health, and, and you will have seen many of the crowdsourcing projects around the university, we think public health will be a big draw. And essentially we will want to sort of syndicate our maps out to as many people as possible and get them to validate um, our predictions in different parts of the world. And one of the ways that we'll do that is with a thing called a GeoWiki. So you'll all come across Wikipedia and uh, editable um, text in, in relation to dictionaries where you can actually do the same things with maps and they've done, they've done it in relation to land cover. So you can get a map of what we might, for any location in the world, and we have predicted that you um, have a high occurrence for this, that and the other disease, you can log in and you can say, well, we think that's um, good, bad or indifferent. And if we do this properly, we can start to um, rank all of our people that do the, the crowdsourcing as well. So there's very nice ways that you can get feedback loops into here as well. And we hope to partner with um, Trudy's group here, the Global Health Network, to essentially that we'll have pre-organized user groups into relations to many of the diseases that we're worried about. And finally, of those 174, clearly there'll be um, quite a gradient in those that have um, public health interest. And those that are really um, very important to us to nail, so those that, for example, are in the, the top 20 of the global burden of disease, we will um, start to bring together expert panels of arbiters. So I do also need to um, say, why on earth would we do this? So to convince you a bit of the audiences here, um, we're not just stamp collectors. We don't want to make a, a, a glossy atlas, but that is actually one thing I would like to see in the, in the next five to ten years. But it's a, it's a spatial audit. It's, a, it's essentially um, auditing that whole spectrum of infectious diseases, um, and we can use those for advocacy. We can use those for tracking change. And I think we can also do an, a much better job than we currently do in advising in relation to travel health. The Global Burden of Disease Programme will be a major partner in this moving forward. Um, so we'll start to supply those with um, covariates for as many of these uh, infectious disease conditions as we can. And of course we can help them improve the timeliness of that if we can update and automatically update those conditions moving forward. Depending on how, we, um, how successful we are in this first phase, I think biosurveillance is not too big an ambition either. And I would just like you to think about the fact that how on earth do you, um, for if we really don't know, um, which we don't, as I've showed to you for many, many of these infectious diseases, how on earth do we know if something's out, you, unusual, an outbreak is unusual in space, if we don't really have a really good idea at the moment about what its natural niche is? And I would say that that's true for many of the conditions that we might be worried about. So I have almost used up my time, um, uh, but you'll be glad to know we're on the last, uh, we're on the home, home stretch here. And we also need to think about the future. So one of the things that uh, we are often tasked to do with our maps is to, to look at them and try and infer what things are going to change. Now, this is a horrible ask, um, and the literature is actually... Um, I had a few of these quotes, but then I, 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 I took them out because I thought they were too mean. Um, but there, there are essentially lots of people on record as to saying things like, um, we will all be starving in the UK by uh, the year 2000 because of population growth. And this is not the type of predictions that we want to do. But I just want to, in this sort of overview talk, highlight a few things that I think are going to be very important epidemiologically and that we should uh, strive to keep an eye on. Um, I don't dismiss climate change or biodiversity loss here, but you will have heard an awful lot about those and I don't have an infinite amount of time. Um, so I'm going to focus on these ones here. And the first one is population. So many of you will be familiar with these types of um, graphs here. So this is time again, and this is approximately, well, this, no, this one is exactly, um, so what's the data? No, this is approximately like my lifespan. So we've gone, we're about 7 billion people today, and we're going to go to um, plateau about 10 billion. People argue about that somewhere between 9 and 11, um, but there, there is a, an end in sight. Um, and we'll, that plateauing, people predict, will be in about 2050. 
tropical populations, and this is sort of starting to come back and get us back to the Royal Society's aims and objectives and thinking about the tropics and what particularly might be problems there, is the tropical population um, exceeded the non-tropical population in 2007. So there's already more people in that part of the world. And these maps here, essentially this is a population map of the world, and you just total up population by latitude or longitude, and it does start to give you an idea of essentially where all the people are, it's slightly north of the equator here, and all in the east. Um, so that's where all the people are now. If you look at where all the population growth will be, so it's this part of the graph that you're looking at in the future. This is our temperate part of the world, not a great deal of change here. So all of those new people will be in those tropical parts of the world subject to many of those infectious diseases that, we're, um, that we've talked about um, earlier in the talk. So the, 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 the point here is, it, is essentially global population is a, a big feature for the globe, but it's particularly an issue in the tropics, and it will have big epidemiological impacts, not least because we just have that many more people to deal with. This, I have to um, credit uh, Marius Gilbert, who I think is in the, in the audience, and this is something that I hadn't ever really thought about until recently. But humans, in terms of, so the axes here are essential host biomass. So if we think about us and the environment as uh, from a pathogen's perspective, we're just walking things that could be infected. And essentially the biomass of those is a good indication of uh, how they're um, stratified. And in fact, it's our livestock that uh, present the biggest opportunity for um, many of our uh, diseases. And, uh, and this, I don't think many of us um, appreciate. Of course, many of the diseases that we're worried about of those 174 have a link to um, wildlife either explicitly as a zoonosis or... That shows me my time's up, but we're, we're, we're very close. And um, it, it's essentially as well just to... Um, bring home the point that this, the changes in the, in, in the way that we um, feed ourselves are going to be extremely important. And again, just to bring home the notion that that's not really going to change. Um, I don't have figures for the future here, but you can see that we've kind of stabilised in um, the temperate parts of the world, but it's the tropics that are having the big growth in the um, livestock there. So the opportunities for pathogens, it's not just humans, but all the, all the things that we rear to feed ourselves are growing massively as well. I should have pointed out that these um, little thumbnail map here just remind you of the, um, the tropics versus the non-tropics that we're considering. Global energy consumption, well this is, um, you know, we, we might reassure ourselves that population is plateauing in about 2050. Well, these data show that there's actually no plateau in consumption um, predicted by anybody. In fact, I, I'm going to say that this is um, uh, uh, one of the things that I worry about uh, even more than population growth is our just our unbelievable um, uh, capacity to uh, essentially use energy. So again, if we look at this axis here, again approximately uh, uh, my lifespan, we, this is billion of tons of oil equivalent. We've gone from three to 12 billion tons um, over this duration. And we're projected to increase to about 18 billion tonnes equivalent in 2040. And, and there are various sources for these figures. But again, this is a kind of reversal of, um, sorry, this is a reversal of fortunes in, in relation to the um, tropics. So they get a very small fraction of that uh, energy moving forward and we dominate it in our part of the world. And again, I think that's a, a really important thing to us to factor in when we try and think about how the world might change in the tropics. Finally, um, transport, and I, I just pick out um, the global air network here, and this, um, if you were fortunate enough to be born in 1933, were all the international flights that you could take at that particular time. Um, I, and they're even hard to pick out, there's a few here, um, and they come from this particular book here, so there's, there's nothing new in the world, so back in 1933 we were talking about epidemiology in relation to air travel. But just to sort of drive that home, how much that's changed today, if you want to travel around the world now, you can do it much more effectively. And the backdrop there was our, our dengue map. So you can see that dengue has also spread in that time. So the notion here to get across is that tropics aren't isolated. Uh, you know, we are a very, very connected world, and that connection is um, increasing. And again, just to come back to the notion of population, 
That circle there is an interesting one in that more people live inside that than outside of it. And uh, I think when you start to... Um, I, I would love to be able to put one of the livestock as well over that, but I, I, I don't have that information. So, Marius, maybe if you could uh, provide that for me, that would be great. But it's just uh, an idea to think about the, the world is, uh, is essentially very skewed and that these are some of the uh, factors I think we will have to bear in mind as we're making uh, cartographies moving forward. All of these things will eff effectively um, uh, intervene with the distributions and the realised niches of the pathogens that we're trying to predict. So you'll be glad to know that we're almost there, so my conclusions are... Um, we've talked a little bit about the society and I hope that I've managed to let you know that it's got a glorious history and, and I do hope that it has a glorious, history, uh, a glorious future and I'll try and be um, part of that. Um, I've also tried to highlight the global burden of disease for you and you'll have seen that although we've done a lot so I don't think we need to be um, too depressed about the state of the world at the moment, we do have a lot still to do and uh, that is really a problem of the tropics and that that problem of the tropics is one of infectious diseases. I've also talked about the history of our mapping and essentially tried to say that that was both poor in the way that it was done and in the diversity of things that were done. I've tried to argue that the way that we map things now is at least richer in kind, but it's very poor in extent. We haven't really addressed the landscape of infectious diseases that we could. And I've also tried to say that in the future I hope we can both be rich in kind and in extent so that um, with the notion of a braid um, which we are fairly optimistic about uh, getting funded but I can't uh, talk about that anymore that we'll be able to um, uh, rapidly improve our knowledge in that space. I've also then tried to talk about some of the things that I think will be important for us as a, a group and a community to think about in the future in relation to tropical disease. And if you will indulge me just for my final acknowledgement slide, it is one of those chances, um, those rare chances that you get to thank people. And what I do want to do is thank my family who are here for their support over the years, and particularly my wife, wherever she is, just, just down there. Um, and I also would like to do the more traditional thing of um, thanking my department, the Department of Zoology, and it was uh, it, when you start to get reflective and do these talks, I realised that I will have been with you for 20 years in October, and I would like to pick out very particularly David Rogers, Sarah Randolph, Willie Wint and Sunetra Gupta, who particularly at the early stages of my career were all fantastically generous with their time, and, and that's really important for, for young scientists, and I just hope I can do as well as the example that you've set. I would also like to thank the Wellcome Trust, and again, getting a bit reflective, you allow me to do what I think is one of the most privileged jobs in the world, and you've allowed me to do that for 15 years. Long may it continue. <laughs> I uh, uh, would like to thank St John's College, who have welcomed me um, very recently, and for all of their help in uh, arranging today. And also the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene for their faith in me and I hope to earn that over the next couple of years. I'd also like to thank my lab. Um, they make uh, going to work uh, always an experience. And uh, I would also like to thank um, everybody listed there I won't, um, I, who have helped enormously with lots of the figures and graphics and, and put up with me over the last couple of months in putting all these maps together. So that's it. I'm going to leave you with that, other than to say that one of the most important things that we need to do as a society is get lots of people to attend our meetings. And our next one is about this time next year. Um, it will be devoted to measuring progress, and it's in Oxford Town Hall. And it will be about measuring progress not just epidemiologically, so not just in terms of scientists, but we want to bring in a much wider range of communities scientists, non-government organisations, funding bodies even, and challenge them to look at what they do, how they evaluate themselves day to day, and really how um, we can improve the way that we conduct business in relation to public health a lot more widely than just our scientific impact. And of course I have a, a newfound interest in this in just starting with the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene and thinking about how after two years I'm going to get up and be able to justify to you that I've done a good job or not. So with that, thank you very much for your time and attention and shall we have some wine? <laughs>